Hello, okay, so welcome back to Balance Psychologies and today I have Sarah Squires, nurturing coach. Um, we're both gonna be talking about Narc narcissistic mothers. mothers. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, so today we, like I said, we're gonna be talking about narcissistic mothers and to how, what kind of um, tra characteristic traits, um, possibly also um, kind of tips and suggestions how to handle that because for some of you um, it's something it's, it might be a recent uh, discovery and so that's going to be quite awful and obviously very anxiety provoking so we want to help you and possibly talk through that with you but also some of you may already know this from childhood and we also welcome you hello Brian uh, we also Hi. welcome you as well um, on this uh, live. So really today is more about a question and answers. Obviously we are going to be um, helping you as much as possible. We are going to be talking about it and everything, but um, today really is more about, you know, um, question and answers and anything that, um, hello Cheryl and hello Sean um, and Andy, hello. <clears throat> and Black Sheep Ninja, hello, good morning to you. Um, so yeah, basically any questions, your mother is a covert narcissist, oh goodness. So how have you, how have you found growing up with that type of parenting skill? Oh, hello Hayley, Courtney and Lacey, Stanley, hello, good morning. Hi Kim, <laughs> hi Dawn. <laughs> You're very welcome, Sean. So Sarah, tell me, um, because Sarah really is, she's, she works with um, predominantly parental alienation. And although, um, although like, you know, the term you might not um, kind of know what that's about, because it is, it is, do you know what, I didn't even know about it, but I know that I, myself and my daughter have been affected by that. So um, these are characteristic traits of narcissists. And basically, maybe Sarah, do you want to explain a little bit about what parental alienation is, but then also how that ties in with, how it ties in then with narcissistic mothers? Definitely. Well, parental alienation, um, it can be anything from when you're in a relationship with someone, it can be um, belittling you, setting you up to fail, basically stating that they are the better parent and trying to trying to damage that relationship between you and your children. Um, you. What it then progresses to is once the relationship breaks down, the okay, narcissist sorry. will try and cut that relationship up completely. In their head, when you become an ex-spouse, you become an ex-parent. There's no yeah. there's no crossover for them. You you are either with them and the kids or not with them and the kids end up. There's no there's no normality with that. There's no retained family system that stays in place. So narcissistic mothers tend to use parental alienation um, partly because they have they have the um, custody rights a lot more in many countries, and also they have okay, cool. we have this idea that um, women are the more nurturing of the sexes, so therefore are the better parent, and so it becomes quite easy for a narcissist to use parental alienation not only to push the non-narcissist out of the family, but also to continue the abuse. Because the abuse would have been would have been going on in that relationship prior to the end, the child would have it, the child could have been a golden child, yeah, or a scapegoat, and so it would have been happening. But when when the um, relationship ends, that abuse continues. It just the protective person, the non not parent, is removed completely. From the environment and so and they're scapegoats aren't they they're, they're said they are they say to the child then that that, that parent is the one with mental health issues mm. and they alienate them from the actual children and that is just do you know what that's so heartbreaking because then you're gonna have to try and prove to your child that you're you're not the mad one and that you are have got the child's best interest at heart isn't it and you've got mm. to try and prove to the narcissist which is they're not going to listen this is it's part of it's part of their smear campaign to say that you're basically unwell and it's part of the abuse it is isn't <clears> in some cases they they even they go so far as to actually believe that they are doing that 
I call it the narcissist triangle. It's been it's been used in many other forms, um, but it's essentially it's really there's always it's in family systems theory whereby there's an abuser, a protector, and a victim. In reality, the narcissist is the abuser, but what happens yeah. is a narcissistic, narcissistic mother will play the role of victim, therefore making you the abuser, and the child and yourself will take into. You'll, you'll cross over that role of protector and victim, but the narcissist will remain as um, the either a protector, protector or a victim, and you will always be the abuser. Oh, I'm and so it's sorry. that it is that triangle, and they're constantly trying to get you to get back in that triangle. Yes, because they need that feedback. Enmeshment, them. isn't it? it you is talked that, about yeah. enmeshment as well. That cult it's like. just the most weirdest thing. Yes. So Doreen was asking what happens, and I hope that I get this right uh, when, I'm, when I'm asking Sarah. Doreen was asking about um, when there is an only child, and so it's the ch child between the narcissist and yourself. How, how do you cope with that? So are you the only child, or is it your child that's the only child? I think it's the child. Doreen, could you just re yeah, could you, you ask that question? Which one it is? Sorry, well, we, can, we can cover it either way, but it, it would it would just add a, a, yeah. a little bit more understanding. But oh, my son, my son, your son is the only child. child. Okay. Right. So this, your son is essentially the only link that the narcissist still has to you. They're the only. Okay. Um, you're the only source of supply that they have. So you and your son are in the essentially in the same role, but with different narcissists. In the fact that you they're feeding off of both of you so they they need you to feed into the drama they need you to play your part in that triangle because if you're if if they can't play you as the abuser then they can't be a victim and they can't protect so they you have to be part of that if you step away from that triangle how do they fit in how where where's their purpose so they yes. constantly need to pull you back into that um what tends to happen as well with narcissistic mothers and if you're an only child then they could be an engulfing mother whereby you can't do anything without their say so they are literally tied to your hip or glued to your hip you can't cut the apron string sorry to use a couple of really old wives where <laughs> tails were there but the not sprung to mind um yeah, but we're a couple of old fans that's <laughs> why exactly <laughs> they just spring to mind yeah um so Oh, you can read that. No, no, <laughs> um, that's not what. No, um, there's something different. I think. Okay. Yeah. So, if you're if you have an engulfing mother, then that then your mother will be with you every step of the way. That she'll want to know every single thing that you're doing. She'll disapprove of partners, disapprove all your decisions, essentially because she wants to remain in control and that will that will continue as long as you allow it to continue yes. so even though when you're a child it stunts your development your natural development because naturally yeah, children want independence such a good point. don't they yes that's a natural part of their development and as a normal parent we encourage that independence we encourage them to fly the nest but it, but a narcissist mother doesn't want that. A narcissist mother wants you to stay at home with them. They'll guilt trip you. They'll say, after all I've done for you, you can't leave me. I wouldn't cope. Would you really do that to me? All of those kind of things to keep you in in their in that triangle essentially. And I'm not surprised because Dorian was just saying that is it your son that had run away at 16 with no life skills, wanted to mm. get away from from that absolutely now i do i've got to say that as you as you're saying that that's really making me think because i i know of a real life example of where a mother and her son really um stunted the emotional um development and it was kind of like she was viewed as his wife so to speak what's that about i mean a the roles are reversed so her son essentially became her her husband because mm. because the the narc mother got rid of um got, got rid of her kind of normal husband or a husband that's not been mm. diagnosed with any mental health issues and um yeah she she has now uh, assigned her son to to basically um fulfill all of her emotional mm. 
I don't know whether it's sexual needs, but certainly emotional um, needs. Thank you, Miss Terry. Mm -hmm. Look, Anna, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> um, yeah, she's she's basically. Um, and now um, this person that I'm talking about, I mean, he's nearly fifty, and she's basically. I think she's gonna, approaching her her seventies. So this really does go in on to, mm. into older adulthood. Absolutely, and emotional they, is exactly. They, they they lean on them. You can. It, we know that narcissists are emotionally very immature people. They do not have the skills to deal with conflict. They don't have the skills to deal no. with normal everyday emotions like anger, happiness, love. They, they can't deal with them. No. And so they lean on their children to become that source. Even in a relationship, even if there's a couple within a relationship and they have a child... Yeah. That child will be triangulated into the relationship. The child would essentially be asked to take sides. Are you are you on are you on my side or are you on their side? And through fear, oh, the child will essentially you. side with the narcissist. Um, and when the relationship, when the normal relationship breaks down, and it's back to being the narcissist and the child, then those boundaries are gone. There, there, there never were any in the first place. Throughout their childhood, there were no boundaries because the narcissist will get their needs net, their, their needs net, their needs met <laughs> from wherever. <laughs> Sorry, I need to put my teeth back in. But um, they will, yeah, they will get their needs met from wherever. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, they will get, they will ensure that the child is meeting their emotional needs meeting their physical needs That's so sad and it this can be so sad, in childhood we the ch we know that narcissists do Thank commit sure. sexual so. abuse on their children because it's easy to see how it can go from oh just come and give your mum a cuddle she's upset or come and give your dad a cuddle yeah, he's upset yeah, yeah, come yeah. and sit on my knee i'm feeling a bit down come and share my bed because i'm lonely and you can see, I'm not going to go any further with that, but you can see how, how those boundaries are being crossed all the time. And the child is so fearful of rejection yes. from the narcissist mother that they'll pretty much do whatever the narcissist mother asks. And you know what, it's, and, as, and as you're saying that, as I'm listening to you, it's all about um, boundaries, how boundaries are broken. Um, and this is why, you know, in, in, in both of our videos, when we when we do the videos and, and, and what have you, you know, we're always talking about the best way to protect yourself is basically to do is to do with boundaries. Remember, boundaries is what you um, allow yourself to be subjected to and, and what you allow um, into your life. And I'm not saying that the children here kind of ask for it. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying, because children don't understand that. You know, the parent's role is to protect um, their child. But what's happening here is there is no regard for the child boundaries. The, the narcissist parent knows, or they have to have some sort of understanding that that is not right, what's going on, because if they knew that what they were doing was whether right or wrong, they would do it in public, but they know it's wrong. So that's why it's insidious and done behind closed doors. Don't yeah, you I, I find that difficult actually. It's a really, really good point. And I, I think that they know societal norms and acceptable behaviour. They recognise that. Because otherwise, why would they try and fit in with the love bombing and, and the jobs and all of that? Why would they try and fit in? But yeah. I don't think that they think it's wrong. I think you're, they think you're all wrong for thinking it's wrong. <laughs> of course they do. They don't think that them having sex with their kids is wrong. They just know that you would react to that. So that's why they keep it quiet. I don't think they have that, that mo morality that they think, oh, I really shouldn't be doing this. I think that they're selfish and they're... You know what? I want it. I'll take it. It's there. It's mine. You've got to be... There's got to be something seriously wrong with you if you think that having sex uh, with your child is in any shape or form okay. I just think that's the ultimate betrayal. As a social worker, I did a lot of work around with paedophiles and in their recovery and there are, there are those paedophiles that do not actually recognise that they're doing anything wrong. They genuinely, their whole life has been positioned 
so that they can do this. This this is essentially their life's purpose. They take yeah. jobs that allows them access to children. So I think that narcissistic parents are exactly the same. They don't become parents because they're in a loving relationship and they want to create this human that expresses the love between them. Me neither, Auntie. They have children to meet their own need, whether it be to keep a relationship yes. going. Yes, they or do. Or yes. to make everyone think that something is better or to emote because some people think oh if i have a kid then they'll love me that's not yes. what a child is born for but i think that it starts from conception i think that there's a lot that can be said in how a child is um is conceived if we look at that part and i know the work that we're doing is we're looking at how can we get to that point where we're preventing narcissists from actually being allowed in their children's lives in the same way that it would be with schizophrenia, for example. We used to do pre-birth assessments on oh, schizophrenia. Yes. Did you? Okay. Very rarely would children be allowed to return home with a schizophrenic because the risk was deemed to be too high. Why is that any different to a narcissistic parent? Because actually they're not that different. So that, that really, yeah, I, I totally, totally relate to that. I, Like I said, I, um, I worked in many... Um, low secure um, mental hospitals and also in um, supported living units and in, in, in one particular place where I worked I, um, I know that there was um, a pregnant um, lady, well she, she was quite young, she was like I think 21, 22 and she had um, emotionally unstable personality disorder and I think she was at the later stages of her pregnancy and she very much had assigned her own social worker and key worker, key support worker or whatever but ultimately the child, um, when, if she, when she gave birth to the child, the child would be, well, was, was removed away from her because she had a personality disorder and I know that we've talked about this at length um, how is it that, you know, narcissists do have a mental health disorder, a personality disorder? Why are they allowed or why are children subjected to this? They obviously are damaging children and effects reach up until adulthood. It's not the fact that it's just through childhood. If, if it was just childhood, then OK, then, you know, we could have counsellors and therapists, whatever, to put that to put that right. But these effects are lifelong and you know what, does the child ever recover from this type of an upbringing? And so ultimately there's a whole nother generation that is affected mm. by narcissism. Someone just raised a really good point as well in that we're not saying that because you've got a mental health problem that automatically means your child should be removed. What we're saying is that the difference between, like schizophrenia can be managed. Schizophrenia yeah. can actually be managed really well. And they could, given, given that support and given the right medication everything they could actually be really good parents but <clears throat> as the social services they they don't even they kind of they just they, be, they yes. put a cut off um but with narcissists they do not want treatment they don't want that yes. and there is no cure there is no magic tablet that will change this there is no therapy that's going to change them so why is that treated differently because actually borderline and social all of them there are treatment options available there isn't for a narcissistic personality disorder and yeah. yet they're allowed to go out and procreate left right and center ruin lives and we're not doing anything about that and that's i mean i know that's the crux of our work in the long run yes how yeah how do we that? tackle that how do we get this assessment criteria and, and that classification because as we know um, narcissistic personality disorder is on a spectrum so there can be low functioning narcissists or you know high functioning narcissists and there's so many other um, classific or differentiations within the um, diagnostic um, criteria for a narcissist but uh, do you know the thing is we're just at the start of this um, how do I say of this kind of discovery or kind of learning about it because mm. You know, I'm conducting research into um, emotional memory and emotional processing of narcissism. And I'll tell you something, emotional processing and memory um, research has been done for like literally 40 or 50 years. But the thing is, there's none on um, personality disorders and let alone narcissistic personality disorders. So I don't even have like previous research to go on. This is all new territory that basically we're covering. And I just, I just can't believe it. I, I just cannot understand how how this hasn't been this problem or this diagnosis hasn't been looked at because i mean it has been around 
since there was the creation of humans. But I think Freud was the first person who actually talked about narcissism and um, hysteria and all of those in his writings and well, in his essay, in essay writings. Um, but he was the one that kind of um, brought it up and, and talked about it. But, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of people that don't like Freud. And so I think so, too, Brian. I think it's done on purpose. I think that these individuals are highly skilled at being able to hide. Um, the only way that you would ever be able to kind of uncover what's going on is if you're linked to them um, mm, on a close, yeah, mm -hmm. close on a on a um, yeah on a personal level. But the the only thing this is a disorder of emotions and the way they conduct themselves, the way that they process information, and so they're really good out there in the world pretending, you know, in their facade that they are who they are. And you know what? Most of them have really good jobs and they're very wealthy. And that is their maintaining factor that, you know, this wealth of, of pushing, pushing this forward and being able to afford their, um, their, uh, lives basically. Um, and so, yeah, they con us. They're able to kind of, um, be somebody else with this facade and and that's the same you know like even with with narcissistic mothers to the outside world they present that they are these amazing mothers and they live through their children you know their children are what defines them you know and and, and they measure themselves um, on how good a parent they are and their children have to be able to um, what's the word push that forward and, and kind of highlight that them and if the child is not doing that then they don't like they don't like the child and so that then the child becomes scapegoated the child has to serve a purpose to the parent absolutely and someone asked an interesting question that i wanted to go back to which was how do they manage to get people to side with them and i think particularly uh from a narcissistic mother point of view there's lots of different layers one of them is the fact that what Manisha just talked about, which is that they're incredibly good at hiding it and they present as the perfect parent. They'll probably go to every parent evening because they're, they are an engulfing parent. So they'll be there, everyone. They want to look like they're perfect. Um, and But then there's other layers which are society as a whole. That's we a do point, believe yeah. that women are... We believe that the the attachment to the mother is stronger than the attachment to the father and actually there's no empirical evidence to support that whatsoever lots of research is done on attachment theory which proves that actually it's the quality of the connection the attachment that counts not who it's yes. to not the gender of the person that it's to and so as a society we need to change that we need to we need to accept yes, that understand. that mothers can be abusive when we that it kind of makes people balk at the very idea that a mother can't be abusive. A mother's always nurturing. No. And actually, that's not true. Mothers can be just as abusive as men. The trouble is, all that's talked about in the press is abusive fathers. And when it's a mother, they kind of try to say they must have been influenced by someone or they must have a mental health problem where we're not, which we know narcissism is, but actually we're not, ident we're, not we kind of make excuses for women that commit these crimes. Um, but it's happening and children, children are desperate for their parents' love, whether it be men or women. And the mother role is more acceptable because so many single parents, we when fathers are, leave the relationship um when a father leaves the relationship it's kind of like we go that's what men do Thank but you. when when a mother leaves a relation leaves the children then everyone's up in arms about that because uh, yeah. we we kind of yeah. have come to expect that men will leave their fa leave the children but actually what we're finding is that men don't leave very few men leave their children by choice they, they can be alienated. So all those people that you've heard are actually deadbeat dads. They might not be deadbeat dads at all. They might be alienated parents who aren't being allowed to see their kids. We also have generational alienation where you can have three or four generations of one family. Non, there's no men. There's no fathers. The, the, grandma, the grandma's partner's long gone. The, the sister's partner's long gone. Their partner's yeah. long gone. There's no male role models because they all alienate. It's, it is that enmeshed cult-like family whereby you fall out with us, you're out. You're not seeing the kids, you're not coming near us. It's all done and dusted. 
Um, it's scary that is that I I I've um, I've experienced that or I've seen that with my um, own two eyes where it is that enmeshment and it's that cult like. Um, family and the thing is you know that being an outsider I can only comment on being an outsider you know you you look at it and and you kind of experience it and you think there's something not right here it just doesn't you know it's just just something you just something is off key and you don't know you, you have no idea what it is and and the thing is I'm I'm an adult you know and and I've and I've um developed emotionally but can you imagine for a child where they go to school and they see that that their friends aren't reacting like that or their friend's mum doesn't do that and they have no idea what's going on they just know that their family might be a bit different or a bit strange but they have no idea of what is really going on and so this child grows up you know really um getting damaging messages and not being able to um get a real stable sense of self um mm -hmm in themselves and having to constantly please their mother or, or their father, which is just so they, sad. They can be very lonely as well because the narcissist mother won't want the child to have friends outside of the family because what if someone sees what's going on? What if someone spots? What if someone talks out about it? What if they take them away? So they'll try and keep family or they'll make sure that they only make friends with people that they're friends with they won't allow the child to choose their own friends they won't allow their child to go off and have an independent life outside they will they will try and control all those friendships so the child will end up incredibly lonely and unsure of how to maintain even form relationships with other people yeah when they yeah. get to that when they get to um the stage development where they're where friends become the most important thing, they don't have that because they can't connect. They can't. No. They can't bond, and that's and they, there's another um, there's another problem. Dawn um, was asking why why is it so bad being the golden child? Because you know being the golden it child good, doesn't it? Yeah, it you're does. put on a pedestal. And the problem is that as a golden Emotional child, child yes. all you all you are is um, you're a trophy essentially. You are paraded around to look how great I am. I've produced this. Look how great I am. They're, they're good at that. That's because of me. That's because of what I've done. But if as soon as you, as a golden child, suddenly think, actually, you know what? Say, say you're really good at swimming, for example, and you've enjoyed it and you've got a natural talent for it. It's been great. The narcissists have loved that because they've shoved you into the limelight and taken you and bought you all the latest things. And it looks from the outside like brilliant. But actually, when yeah. you turn around, you say, you know what, I really don't want to go training tonight. I want to go and see my friends. No, that's not what, no, you've got to go training. You're not allowed to make those choices for yourself. And that can become really, um, there's a lot of um, yeah. aggression then that appears because yeah. suddenly you're not doing as you're told. Suddenly you want um, something external from... The, the world that you want something outside of the uh, mother and they're not going to like that so they're going to mm. try and rein you in even more so whilst golden child sounds amazing actually it's not because you're not allowed to be your mm. own true self you're not allowed you're, yeah. you have to be who they want you to be yes that's right the golden and children absolutely. yes you're right Susie and the thing is um and Hayley you were saying that also in your experience you the golden child syndrome you know flitted from one sibling absolutely. to another it doesn't... and it can happen on a daily basis you could really? be you could be oh my flavor God. of the month you could say something really small and to hurt you they will suddenly put all the attention on the other sibling and then to hurt that sibling they'll put all the attention on you and so this is why anxious attachments are formed because the child doesn't know do they love me do they hate me i don't know because the narcissist is constantly using you and pitting you against each other because they want you to fight for that her attention they would love that that, that boosts their self-esteem. That makes them think, God, I must be amazing. My kids are fighting for me. But, and the reality is that that's, they are fighting, yeah. but it's, it's certainly not from no. a good point of view.
because and, and Haley was saying that she never knew where she stood no. so yeah there's an unstable sense of self then obviously you become really um you know you're not you're you're shy you're not confident you don't know how to be around possibly even social situations because there's mixed messages as well as when you're growing up and PTSD so, is a, can, a, can be a result of that as well because you're constantly uh, yeah. on edge you're constantly unsure what's coming next am I gonna get a hug or am I gonna get a smack like Kevin and so you're that tense re releases all the stress hormones constantly because you are you're like this all the time yeah. love or hate love or hate and so yeah PTSD is a massive problem high levels of cortisol it can it can produce a lot of physical health problems as well but then, okay, so then it does cause a PTSD, and I don't know about this, but say, for example, you were the golden child, and, you know, because I I, I saw as well with experience where um, this particular um, child uh, was always the golden child, and he managed to stay the golden child for quite some time, and um, this child that I'm talking about he doesn't really have a, st a stable sense of self. He's very, um, he uses alcohol. He's, he's quite young as well. Um, and um, why is it then, even though they were um, the golden children and they've gone on to develop PTSD, do they then have a, a predisposition then to go on and be de develop as full-blown narcissists with the full spectrum? It's perfectly possible because if you think about... We don't, the trouble is, we don't know 100% what causes narcissism. We, we, it's a combination of things. We know that it could be genetic. We know it could be childhood trauma. We know it could be disorganised attachment. We know it could be brain injury. There's very, there's various things that play a part into behavioural? it. But don't you think it's mainly behavioural then? Well, you, the, if you have a brain injury to the frontal lobe, then oh, yeah, that can yeah, cause yeah, psychopathic traits, which are essentially the same as a... So we don't know, this is the thing, and this is again what, why we're trying to do this work is we want to understand that so that we can protect children. But certainly witnessing narcissistic behaviours, you're going to learn them, aren't you? Because we learn how to be a human being and but an even, adult but from even an around em us. Yeah, but yeah. even an empath, even if you're in a relationship or you're around them, you take on those you traits do. as well. You do. So a child, of course they're going to learn that. A child are sponges, aren't they? Yeah. So they're going to pick up how to behave. They're going to learn how to lie and manipulate and they're going to be rewarded for those things so it's going to reinforce that that's how they should behave um and so there's every possibility that they can become the a narcissist but equally they can not it, okay. there's other factors we again there's no a plus b equals c it's a case of how resilient are they what other protective factors are there in place so it may be that what would be those protective factors that were... It can be a, a loving, non-narcissistic parent who teaches them other ways, builds the resilience in oh, them. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so if you're co-parenting with a narcissistic mother, if you're a man and your ex is a narcissistic mother, then yeah. you, bo you boost your child's self-esteem, you work on that internal working model, you make them have that blueprint, which is confident... They're self-assured, they know who they are, they have clear boundaries. These are things that you work on. So that's a that's a resilient factor. It could be that society as a whole can be can play a part. That if if services intervene and do the right thing, that's a protective factor. But they never do. Could, <laughs> no, they they're not brilliant at it, but they, they, they that intervention sometimes can be enough to act as a deterrent in, for a period of time. Um, or enough for the child to have the confidence to speak forward. Um, Thank you, Angela, but there's, you joined us. It can Sorry. be a grandparent. A grandparent yes. can be a resilient person. Um, a sibling can be a resilient... There's, lot, there's, there's lots of things that, that can build resilience. Just the actual genetic makeup of a child, one child will be more resilient than another. Again, as with all child development, there's no A plus B equals C. It is... It's a combination of factors, and sometimes it is that perfect storm. Thank you for joining us, Eddie. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Um, so, say for example, you know, your mother um, has been, or is, has been, is mm -hmm. a narcissist. Um, how do you then 
for example, how do you how do you manage communication? How do you cope with a narcissistic mm -hmm. mother? Say you have found out, or you've or you've recognised certain traits, and your mother, um, kind of, you identify that she is um, a narcissist. How then do you protect yourself going forward? Uh, you know, presuming that you're an adult, that you've found this out. It is hard because. Um, they're your parents and regardless of their faults you still love them that's an innate quality that we have that we love our parents regardless of how yeah. they treat us but again it goes, with, I feel like we're playing the same record but it does come back to those boundaries of you need to be very clear with yourself and this is what's so hard when you've grown up with a narcissist mother but it's never too late to start the work so hopefully you take on board some of the things that we say it is looking at what what are you willing to accept what if they're still trying to control your life what boundaries are you going to put in place at what point are you going to say you know what i appreciate your opinion but it's my decision thank you very much at what point are you going to say i'm not even going to talk to you anymore because you, it's hard to go no contact, but it is always an option for you. And it's they will guilt trip you and try and make it not. But it is about what are you willing to accept? What sort of life do you want? And being clear on who you are, what you're prepared to accept. And it is. Yes, it's about learning who about who you are mm -hmm. and identifying that what has happened to you is not normal it's because of your parents mental health and that isn't your fault it's not it's not your um place to try and fix it no. you know it's everybody has their own responsibility okay for themselves and so do the narcissists and they know that but in order to kind of displace that responsibility and put it on their children that's what they do because it's easier to blame someone else than actually say oh it was it's my fault it's it's my fault that um, my child has turned out like this it's everybody's response it's their own your own responsibility and i guess that's what it is you have to I, you have to kind of learn who you are your own identity your own mm -hmm. um personality what do you like doing who are you and it's about again boundaries and this is something that we always talk about it's about allowing um allowing or understanding what you do put up with and what you don't and what you allow into your life and understanding that none of it was your fault none of it whatsoever it wouldn't no. have mattered how you behave what you look like how tall you were how short you were how fat you were how thin you were what color hair you were what color eyes you got if you look yeah. like mom if you look like dad this is who they were they were always going to treat you in the same way and so it's it's detaching yourself from any responsibility for that you did not create them you were no. born into this environment and so none of it is your fault Let, right, letting right. go of that letting go of any blame you might have felt that you did something you never did anything to cause this this is who they are and the thing is um Another thing that is so um, wonderful, you, you've got to think of it this way, that say your mother is a narcissist, she would have gone through the same treatment. Now, you know what that's like because your mother has done that to you. So possibly um, your narcissistic mother, her mother or father would have induced this kind of behavior onto them. And so they know what they're doing to you is wrong and they know how it feels like, yet they still do it. See, I always say this, like the narcissist knows right from wrong and they have a choice. But they chose to carry on those behaviours and hurt another generation. They, like you, could have thought, well, okay, it's wrong and perhaps maybe we need to get some help or I can get some help myself to, to kind of stop that cycle. But they didn't. They haven't. And, um, and the thing is, they carry it on. And like I said, to a, another generation that is affected by this. And absolutely, they have no empathy. Someone asked a really interesting question, which was... Um what what do we think about um an adult son living with a controlling Sorry. mother um and we've kind of touched upon that a little bit but happy to revisit um, and yeah. a control a controlling mother is very difficult and i think for for sons uh, it's it's more difficult because they we learn how, we learn about the opposite sex from our mums or our dad girls learn about men from their fathers boys learn about women from their mothers so yeah. it they want that they want to understand they want to have that closeness with their mother because
they want that later in life. If ever you, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of the Oedipus complex. I'm not going to go into it now, but it is all about you. You, your initial, your very first attraction is to your mother, and with the narcissist wants to keep that in place. The narcissist wants to keep you. Well, answer that question in, in love with them. Essentially, the narcissist wants their son, no matter whether they're five or fifty-five. They want their son to stay in love with them. They want to keep that relationship because it's because gratifying. Of income. Absolutely, it's they want to be eating. They don't see it's them. It's their supply. They yeah. They are like it's it's a drug. They're addicted to that. They have to be noticed. It has to be uh, uh, them. And we don't. They don't see those invisible bonds like we we do. When I think about my parents, I see those invisible bonds that. They're, they're my parents, that's my brother. Narcissists don't see that anywhere. To them, everyone is the same. Everyone is here for their gain. Whether they're yes, their son, their yes. daughter, their mother, their father, it's their cat, about me. Yeah. <laughs> and so a narcissist's mother will keep their son as their partner, essentially. Their husband, yeah, yeah they, they will do. want them in that role because... Especially if they don't have, if they don't have a husband, then they will take the next available man to Because it's easy to role. manipulate, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely. You do what I say and you be the supply that I want. And so it's, do you know what? I, I, I think it's, it's, it's horrifying. Like I saw it firsthand and it's, it's really quite... It's really quite sad, but really unnerving. Mm. I don't know whether you guys have um, experienced or have experience of that, where it, it, you know, it's where you see it and you kind of think, "Wow." Well, someone just said it's like a drug. Well, actually, what you find is with the way narcissists interact with people, mm. it actually releases the exact same hormones in your brain that how heroin does. Exact same. So Dopamine when you yeah, when you take the the drug heroin, it automatically releases those chemicals. They push pull that the narcissist does it releases this exact same. And yeah. so that addiction, this is why codependency is created out of narcissism, is because you're addicted. You're addicted to the not addicted to the narcissist, you're addicted to that rush of hormones that you get that rush of chemicals that go through your body um and yeah it is addictive and so and that narcissist Thank knows you. that and they use that and they are drug pushers yes they're the drug and they yeah. push it yes and because of the feeling of of like this negativity and low mood all the time so when they induce this you feel like amazing because they because you've been validated so now think of this as children, when this happens to a child, they think, oh yes, my, my mum does love me. Oh yes, my dad does love me. And so there's that validation that that child has been looking for time and time again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we feel it as, you know, as, as someone who's, you know, we're in a relationship or someone that we, you know, in a friendship with a narcissist, but, you know, we feel it too. Now, I had an interesting question from um, Leopard King. He, King. he was saying, well, he was asking, if there is no known cure for narcissism, how can they get better? Now, that's really interesting. Essentially, it goes back to, do they want to get better? Do you recognise? Or really do they recognise that there is something wrong? And do they know that what what is wrong? I mean, actually, I've got to say that even I've had um, I've had some narcissists contact me on my channel, or some have emailed me, and some of them do recognise the behaviours that um, you know that we talk about, or what happened talks about on these various channels on YouTube, and um, they know, and they say, well, well, how do we get better? And the fact that they are aware that say some behaviours can be maladaptive, or they do present as as narcissistic, and I guess that kind of it feeds into their kind of shame or guilt that they feel. But I guess ultimately, if you if you recognize it and and you want to do something about it because it's causing you discomfort or it's not it's your life's not working out the way that you want it to, then then yes, I mean obviously there are treatment options. For example, dialectal behavioral therapy um, is wonderful for um, emotional um, for emotional abuse or or emotional work. Um, I don't know, particularly you'd probably be put onto um, antipsychotics, depending on what you score um, on the diagnostic sheets. But yeah, there, I mean, there isn't anything specifically for narcissism, but there is um, for personalities disorders per se, but not, not particularly for narcissistic personality disorders because 
most of them don't recognize and most of them even if they recognize they won't admit that they've got um, an issue it's all very hidden and that's part of the disorder that they are really good at hiding i think as well that i would be wary and this is personal and this is my opinion and my experience and nothing more this is not this is not in any way uh, a general consensus i feel that if a narcissist a narcissist was to contact me to say they want to change I would be concerned that that yes. was a love bombing. Mm. That they were trying to get my... They, are they, just were a they wanted me to <laughs> boost their supply. So I think that, for me, the narcissist, even if they recognised some of those behaviours, they wouldn't ask for help. Because that would be admitting a vulnerability. And what they're also scared of is, if they, go, if they were suggested that they went to therapy or had any kind of treatment... That's picking at a thread that they really don't want to go down. They do not want their sense of false self to be revealed. So they won't access that. So to me, if if someone asked for help that, that had been diagnosed as a narcissist, then it would perhaps more be because they were trying to lure me in as their supply. And that is just my opinion. But I feel that they don't they don't see they don't want to change because they, changing is too much that it's essentially it's changing their entire it is lit, it's not just shedding their skin it's changing their entire way of being and that's mm. i mean that's scary for any of us to think that yeah. but but they just don't i just i personally that's what Do I you know there was um actually what's her name eleanor eleanor greenberg um it's one of her books um i i've got it but i haven't got it here with me she wrote a book on working with narcissists and she's she is a humanistic therapist and she's worked with um, narcissistic personality disorders. So and I guess what she was saying was exactly that she what with a narcissist, because they build so many false selves and so many senses of selves, obviously, to hide that trauma that they've got. It's about essentially unpicking that. But. I guess if you were to work with a narcissist, it's it's really about being able to kind of um, establish some sort of a trust, which I don't know whether whether that can be done. And I I I don't know. I don't know um, because again, it's it's with them. It's deflect, and the defense mechanisms are up here. It just means that, that if they were to trust a therapist, they would have to be vulnerable. Mm, exactly. And a narcissist won't be vulnerable. The thing is, these individuals, you know, they, like we were talking about before, they walk around, they walk among us um, in society, okay? So for them to then suddenly go, oh, there's something wrong with me and I want to put that right, why would they when that, it hasn't been recognized? It, you know, it hasn't, they haven't been bought, you know, bought up um, for it. So it hasn't been recognized. So why would they want to change? I think for those of you out there that maybe um, have been in a relationship or perhaps, perhaps have a narcissistic mother who is telling you, oh, I want to change, I want to go to therapy, my my warning would be, is this genuine or is this just to lure you back in? And only you know the answer to that and only you can and judge that, but that would, be my, that would be my warning is that potentially it may just be a way to suck you back in. Telling you what you want to hear. Yeah. Love bombing. Yeah. So that that's that's my personal opinion. Like I say, I'm not that's not anyone else's, that is just purely my own. I'm, and I might be wrong, but that's how I feel. Someone asked awesome. why do people go wrong when you go no contact? Because you're not giving them the supply. Because <laughs> yeah, you're, not you're out of their them. control. Yes, and it is ultimately about controlling because then they will manipulate you. Well you know this, you don't need me to tell you this, they'll manipulate you to act or say the things that they want so that they can, you know, feel validated. It's about it's about that attention that they never got, and that's that's basically what it's about. And so it exists all the way into adulthood. And if you think about it, they've probably um, they've probably set you up and said that you're this crazy mental person who doesn't leave them alone. You're a stalker. You're this, that, and the other. And if you suddenly get no contact, then that kind of proves that it's a lie, doesn't it? Mm. Because oh, suddenly you're not contacting them anymore. How can you be the stalker, crazy loony that they're saying you are? It's isn't it funny that you're always the one with the <laughs> yeah. mental health disorder? Absolutely. You know, <laughs> mirroring and projection at its best. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>
Smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors. Absolutely, absolutely. Goodness, Sarah, it's like we've been chatting again for like 49 oh, minutes. It wow. just goes so quickly. We should do a two hour live show. Mm. Don't no, we're not doing minutes. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, one hour. <laughs> Yeah. Then we'll get any more questions that they we've want got. to answer. We apologise if we've missed your questions. I don't know if you can see it, but it scrolls really quickly. So we yeah. don't know. And if we're talking, then my eyes and my mouth are disconnected. <laughs> well, so you I can't read exactly. and talk at the you same know, time. <laughs> from my first live, I'm like, what do I do? How do I do this? So, yeah, no, I don't. Yeah. We're in the UK. We are, at the moment, we are Lincoln. Lincoln. We're in Lincoln. Yes. Lovely Lincoln. Yes, with the cathedral. We were out there earlier, yeah. weren't we? For a lovely dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will come to the US. We would love yeah, to come to the US. We are we coming. Would, we are yes. coming. We are coming. We are coming. Just watch give us this time. space. Watch this space. We yeah. want to we want we want to expose this, you know. I'm from up north. It's lovely. It's beautiful. Is it? Have you been up north, Brian? <laughs> I'm a Midlands anyway. We're not up north. We're exactly. Midlands. Exactly. It's it right. raining here. Yeah. yeah. If you're gonna criticise me, get it right where I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, Andy. We are miles away. We apologise. Yes. We can't help our location. No. <laughs> but we've got cars. We, we have got drop. cars. We have got cars. And we have Skype. <laughs> Surrey, oh, that's not far from where you used to yes, be. Yes, I used to be in Surrey as well. Don't want to go back there again. Yay, Midlands. <laughs> <laughs> California. California. Yes, yes, yes we're, we're coming over buying a new bikini sunny. next week. <laughs> Well, we're hoping um, that we all well are we want to, to yeah in Canada across, absolutely yeah. yes we want to we want to do our, yes and in New Zealand as well we're not going to miss you Black Sheep Ninja um, you're in Surrey we'll yeah we want everywhere. to yeah we want to come everywhere we will we will come everywhere we'll talk about it we'll infect everywhere so that everybody knows about this we want to expose this because it's not even about exposing it's about educating people mm. you know that, that something like this exists. Because I tell you something, up until literally seven years ago, I never knew that people like this exist. Andy, I'm doing a conference in April. Keep your eyes open. We're doing a conference yeah, in so April. Watch, um, I'll we'll put, be there together. So. Yes, and it will be on Sarah's um, website. So, yeah, we'll put all the links and everything below. Oh, talking of bits and pieces, we've got a oh, PDF. Okay. <laughs> just for being here. We're giving us stuff away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Sarah. <laughs> Down south. Conference in um, Portsmouth area. Portsmouth area, yes. Eastleigh, I think. Oh, okay. Where the old people are. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anyway, so now yeah, we're going to be giving away, uh, we've got a PDF literally all about like narcissistic mothers. There's kind of like a checklist in there as well to see whether you think that, you know, you're spotting the traits or whatever, that you think that your mum could be um, a narcissist. Um, you can download the free copy of that. We will put um, the link below. So yeah, all you have to do, shout out to Nottingham. Not yes, far, not far. one hour away. One yes, hour I drove past her on the way up actually. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Um, so yeah, we, there's freebies, there's stuff like that um, that you can download. And so I guess it's just something that's like um, a hard copy that you can um, that you can um, kind of access. Corny, we will put our websites down below in the comments box, so you know you can check back if that's okay. For recovery, what I found really helpful, Sam, um, it's a book called <laughs> Trauma Bonds, um, and it's <laughs> in the cupboard, but I can't me. reach it, so I apologise. Yes, I can't tell you who it's by. She'll open the drawer. She'll open the. I thought <laughs> open the cupboard. <laughs> it'll fall on her head. So we better that... not. <laughs> we will be coming to Nottingham soon. Yeah. Yes. Um, but Trauma Bonds is what it's called. Um, I found Can that you... really helpful. Yay, Jackie in the UK. I thought you were in America, but okay. Um, yeah, so trauma bonds. Oh, actually, I did do a blog post about books as well. Oh, Am I Good Enough or something it's called. Um, it's on my blog post. I'll link that detail below as well, where you can you can actually buy it from um, Amazon. I think I've linked them all to Amazon or what have you. Um, I honestly have about five books in my cupboard. Do you want to um, get them? I won't get them out. No, because honestly, it means me going all the way around there, tripping over all the way. 
wires and everything. <laughs> it would be, it would just be a nightmare. So, but I will <laughs> I will put something together with books that have helped and books that <laughs> for your own research and education. Yes, we yeah. Actually, what we'll do is we'll again we'll put it all in the comments below. Yeah, the trauma bond is mm. one of the worst. It's the worst feeling because you kind of second guess yourself all the time. Psychopath Free. Oh, okay. Psychopath Free is a good book as well. Yeah. I haven't read that one, but I would. I would like to. I think that was recommended to me as well. If my ex. Is oh, I'm so sorry. I only managed to read the first line. If my ex was a narcissist, that's all I got. And I can't even. I didn't even get to read your name. I'm so sorry. Yeah. If you want to pop it up quickly, we've still got some time. I'll try. Okay. That's Thank whose work I'm following, um, Courtney, is Dr. Childress. That's, oh. It's not the guy you're, you're working with. Yeah. yeah, so Sarah and Dr. Childress are doing some work together. No, I'm not working with him yet. I'm trying. I'm trying to get in there. She will be. But I'm doing all, I'm, that's, that's the work I'm following. That's the uh, same sort of model. Thank you, Dawn. Oh. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yes. Appreciate so we've it. still got some time. Um, do you have any other questions or any other kind of thoughts that, or, and things that you want to share or want to ask us some questions? Does a narcissist love their children, Kimberly well, Taylor? Does a narcissist love full stop? Personally, I don't think they're capable of that. Mm -hmm. They don't understand. Um, yeah, parental alienation is something that, that I talk about quite a bit. But um, I personally think if they love their child, then they wouldn't treat them in that way. To love is to put someone else's needs above your own. And a narcissist is incapable of doing <clears> that. So to me, no, the answer is no. They can fake love. But I know, I don't believe that they love. They mirror it, don't they? Because mm. they will, remember, they, they, they mirror our emotions. They can't feel it for themselves. And it's the same with a mother or a father, because I know there was a comment here before as, uh, just there um, where, where you asked whether the father is the same. Yes, it's the same. It's, it doesn't matter what gender they are. They both are going to exhibit the same behaviours. Uh, someone asked, why do they, why does the narcissist focus on and hurting one particular child? Because they want to play ch siblings off against one another. So um, by making one a scapegoat, then basically all of their roles. Yeah, they what, do. From a psychological point of view, the scapegoat is essentially the true self of the narcissist. It, that scapegoat is everything that the narcissist hates about themselves. So it, it's they direct all of their anger, rather than directing it inwards at them, they direct it outwards at the scapegoat. So that's why they pick on one child, but it also it creates all those... Um, different fractions within one family. So no one really connects properly because there's all this fighting over <coughs> any attention that's that's there. Yeah, that's right, Angela. We are all scapegoated. In the end, in we're, the end though, yeah, yeah, in the end, we're, we're all treated the same. So they don't understand what I was, again, they just, they just copy, they mirror, you know, at the end of the day, you're just, they're just mirroring um, your behaviours, your emotions, and it's not actually really them because they don't have a stable sense of self. No. Okay, if I guess if you if they understand, it's their type of love, and I think, I mean that's a valid point, absolutely. But I also think that for them, because I think narcissists don't really grasp the real concept of what love is, and I, th I yeah, I agree. I think it depends what what is love. But if you can give me the answer to what is love, but then we can answer that better. But to but, me, yeah, love is unconditional. Love yeah, is there's no conditions yeah, to it's, it. I, putting someone else's needs and wants and desires ahead of my own and no a narcissist isn't capable of doing those things so that's why i said no is because in my my version of love no they can't they can't love the way i love if you have a different version of love that's absolutely fine so maybe they can love um in those terms but Yes, that's, it's interpretation. And, every, and, that's what, and, and I was just about to say exactly the same thing. Love means different things to all of us. You know, there's this, but ultimately, what, whatever that version is, it is, it's meant to be unconditional. And, you know, you, you have to, you, if you love someone, you, you, you love them unconditionally, whether the good things or the bad things. And a narcissist, I don't think, has that kind of emotional intelligence to be able to understand what unconditional love is for them their love is 
conditional or um, certain emotional, certain gratification is conditional. Mm. Uh, that's a really good point, Andy. The, a new car, yes. Yeah. Objectification, absolutely spot yeah. on. Spot and that, on. Yeah. <clears throat> it is, it's objectification, the Melanie Klein theory. Um, she wrote exactly about it. I'm not going to go into it because it's really long but mm. complicated. But and we don't have much time left. Yeah, I've got, they hate it when you when you they don't you don't give them love because they desperate they desperately want that at the, at the core of them. And I'm not going down a sympathy road, but at the core of them is a very damaged child yeah. who actually at some point probably just wants a really good love and a hug. Unfortunately, they are so damaged that no matter how much you love them, you can't fix them. And I know. As fellow empaths, we tried. We really tried. And I'm sure you can all relate that no matter how much you love them, you can't fix them. No, you really can't. It's it's really it's really sad. It is really sad. And it, this isn't this isn't a um, you know, a witch hunt for narcissists. This is just literally just to, for you guys just to understand mm. what's going what's going on and why they are the way they are. You know, they're human beings too, but and they're very damaged, but not really anything that can be done. So I'm again looking at the time. I can't believe where the time has gone. So fast. Like it just goes. It's such a shame. It's already just gone over one hour. So we're going to bring this to a close. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining me. I absolutely love doing the lives. Um, I know that some of you, for some of you, where you are in the world, it is the morning and very early mm -hmm. hours in the morning. So I do appreciate you joining and I hope that you were able to get something from my live. I will be back again next Tuesday at eight o'clock and I will be releasing another video later on this week. Um, remember also Sarah the nurturing coach she has a live every Sunday evening at eight o'clock so you can join her over on her channel which I will put the details below she's also got a website which um, if you have any um, questions to do with parental alienation or par um, par narcissistic parents or that kind of like the trauma bond that you have perhaps with your parents um, please do contact Sarah Squires at The Nurturing Coach. I will be putting all of her details in the comment box below, along with the free PDF. Your freebie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's so generous. Thank you again, guys. And I um, hope to see you again next week. So it's just going to be me. It won't be Sarah. Mm. Sarah's got her own live on Sunday. Yes, Sunday night. Eight. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.